guys, this is Derek Kirby from Dallas Prospect, and I am joined again, as uh, as you can possibly already hear, by my Mavs Fast Break co-host, Eni Duca, and we are ready to talk some Mavericks playoff basketball. We are, what, one day out for our first playoff game in quite some time. Eni, how are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. It has been Quite some time since I got on the pod with you, Derek. Um, and also has been quite – it almost feels as long as uh, how, how long the Mavs have been outside the playoffs. Um, but <laughs> but it's been since 2016 since the Mavs have been in the playoffs. So yep. I'm excited about watching them play playoff basketball again. We're going to learn some great things about our team. They're going to learn some great things about herself. And those four years beforehand, I mean, yeah, there were – they were the craziest times. Um, they were the not so fun times. But I think, as a fan base, we need those times so we can properly appreciate the days that are yet to come, being led by Luca and KP, um, oh, winning championships throughout the twenties. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we were spoiled. You know, we got the one title, yes, but we were spoiled by the twelve straight fifty win seasons and all of that. Going to the playoffs generally as a pretty high seed, at least. So, yeah, it's easy to take it for granted in that moment. But, yeah, post-title has been definitely up and down, and the past few years have been not the absolute bottom of the barrel, but certainly in, in, that, uh, in that region there. So, yes, now that you have two young stars, potential superstars, I, I would say Luca's already at superstar point, and KP is knocking at the door of superstar. Um, you definitely feel much, much better moving forward. The question here is how can these guys adapt to playoff basketball for the first time? Like we know what Luca's done overseas and everything, but it's just different here. Like it's a different environment. There's a more physicality, I think, to this, and it's going to be it's going to be a grind in an environment that even if he's more adept than a lot of guys in this situation, a lot of young guys, it's still just a different animal. Yeah, but yeah, I totally totally agree. I mean, we did see just because we're a young team, we we have seen young teams have some success. I'm sure you you remember the Jazz versus OKC two years ago, being led by a young rookie Donovan Mitchell, um, beating Russell West Russell Westbrook and Paul George. Uh, so I mean, it and is Mello. possible, and and Melo too, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it is possible. Um, but here's the thing. We're going up against the Clippers. Yes. Um, I know that this, there's a second seed. People, um, you know, I, I, for one, think they're the, probably the best team in the league. They're the most well-put-together squad in the league from top to bottom. Um, you you see just their, your, your bench unit coming out. Uh, I mean, it's – Yeah, if it's that unit, crazy. If, if that unit played a whole season together, there, it will probably be, you know, up there contending for a ninth seed – in the bubble. Um, yes. so they, they are well rounded. Um, and so it's going to be a tough, it's going to be a tough couple of games. Uh, hopefully, you know, tough five, tough six, you know, even tough seven and we can give them a run for the money. If we can beat them, that will be f -f -f fantastic. I'll tell you. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you mentioned their scoring depth and everything like that. They got two guys mm -hmm. on their bench averaging 18. They got two yeah. of the three finalists for sixth man of the year. Which, by yep. definition, almost seems like bullshit. <laughs> like, come on, one of you is clearly the seventh man. Decide. But uh, I kid. But yes, their their scoring prowess on the Clippers is ridiculous. I think they are the deepest team in the league. I think that even though you have teams that are better in terms of their regular season seeding and everything like that, like the Lakers are the number one in the West, and I think their one-two punch is better than the Clippers. But I think total roster Clippers have better depth. And I think the Clippers, um, their, their defensive ability, I think they are built for a deep playoff run here as well, even though, like mm -hmm. we talked about uh, the other day when I was talking with James, the Bucks might be the number one rated defense by a pretty comfortable margin. But I think the Clippers have it like kind of like a LeBron-esque ability to be like, all right, playoffs are here now. We know how to do this. Turn it on. And that's, yeah, that's especially, very... especially being led by Kawhi Leonard too. Exactly. Like that, that I mean, guy. You, got, you got two, three and D specialists, mm -hmm. you know, superstars leading your team who can lock down just about anybody, unless it's Paul George blocking a game winner. 
But uh, <laughs> it, other than that, other than that, you got two guys that can absolutely take over a game, and that that's problematic. You know, that is problematic for anyone to have to match up with. And this Clippers team, with the length and athleticism they have, they do give the Mavericks problems. I mean, the Mavericks were zero and four in the regular season. We talked on that um, the other day against the Clippers. Mm-hmm. And really only one of those games was like right there. There was one three-point loss. Everything else, I think the average margin of defeat was 12 points. So this is a team that largely held pretty tight, but the clutch, as it was in many other cases this season, is where it got away from. And that's where you separate your good from your great teams. So that that's going to be a big challenge. But, you know, the Clippers, with how they're able to disrupt even a historically efficient offense like the Mavericks— is going to be really a challenge Dallas has to figure out an answer for because the Clippers have enough length and athleticism to disrupt and bother the Mavericks' pick-and-roll action. Yep, totally, totally agree. Yeah, if if I had the choice of one team to not play against, I would play any other other of the 13 teams that made the playoffs. I'd rather play them if it's the Bucs, if it's the Lakers. I'd rather be matched up with them in the first round than the Clippers. Yeah, I agree. With them. I think I think they have the one type of roster. They have multiple long, lengthy defenders. I even outside, they don't even need to put in their best couple of defenders on them, like on uh, Paul George or Kawhi. If you wanted to have them try to avoid being in foul trouble, mm-hmm. you can toss in a Patrick Beverly. You can you can bring in Rodney Magruder, or I think that's his name, Rodney Magruder, off the bench. Um, to you know, just to just to throw bodies at Luke, which is Morris. probably a Mark exactly. Just you know, they they have multiple multiple people to throw bodies at Luca. And yeah. if I was to say if that's one thing that uh if I needed one way to stop the Mavs, I would need to stop the guy that pretty much the Mavs offense flows through. So yeah. they definitely have that. Um but it's something that the Mavericks would have to overcome, honestly. Yeah. And we were talking before we were talking beforehand and, and honestly in the playoff playoffs is where, you know, stories are made. Yeah, regular season is awesome, and I, I, mean, I love the regular season. Don't get me wrong, but when when we go into history, no one really ever talks about regular season. Everyone always talks about, hey, you remember game one of, of Dallas versus OKC in 2011 when Dirk put up 40 plus, 40 plus points and stuff like that, or game two yep. versus um, uh, the Miami Heat in the finals where he had the 15-point comeback and the Mavs did and Dirk put up the, the last layup to, to go up, you know, stuff. Like, we we, we, we tend to go back to the finals so for, for legacy purposes and stuff like that. This is right. where, you know, the Mavericks are, are definitely – this is where they're going to, you know, need to show up. And, and I think this is going to be awesome. When the time comes – or I don't want to say – if the time comes when the Mavericks finally get off, they have more data points that they can go back to and then they can go back to the off season. I know it's going to be a short turnaround, but pinpoint things that they're really going to have to work on yeah. where if it was just a regular season, you're not going to, you're not going to get those kind of data points that you're going to get in the, in the playoffs. So it's really, really advantageous for the Mavericks to be in the playoffs right now. That's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about them being in the playoffs. Yeah, a- absolutely. I mean, it, it's a different presentation for sure. Like the the regular season is kind of like you're through the first two acts of the book. But what matters now is how you're going to finish out the season. That's obviously your playoff run here. And it mm-hmm. is where it, it is what people tend to remember. The only regular season I can think of to any degree that people remember specifically as opposed to not as opposed to like the playoffs in that year. But I think the Warriors 73-9 is probably the only thing that comes to mind of like an yeah, individual it, team's thing. It has to be something super historic yes. like that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So this is uh, this is a new stage. This is an entirely new environment. And it's going to definitely give us a better idea of, okay, who, who's, who makes sense for us moving forward? I think if they've continued to find something in Dorian Finney-Smith, something that I admittedly did not think they were going to find in him, um, yeah. the last off season, I mean, damn, I started the season talking about Justin Jackson over Dorian Finney Smith. <laughs> now I, I feel like that's yeah, my worst take of the year probably, <laughs> but I mean, all, yeah. all truth told Dorian Finney Smith has been a phenomenal find for them. And you learn that, you yeah. know, what's he like three year, 12 million, 9 million. I can't remember. It's like three or 4 million oh, yeah. a year. You're paying them. 
Yeah, it's like it's a, we yeah. got we got him for a steal, honestly. Yeah, yeah. like I'll, I'll absolutely take that. And you know, mm-hmm. Seth, he's up and down like crazy, but when he's on, he is a difference maker, and he is a guy that's mm-hmm. also making like eight million in his case. So mm-hmm. you've got value there. You've got a bunch of guys with that. We talked about how they made all these acquisitions and they kind of tried to to cultivate continuity because they wanted to set up these. Instead, for a roster that had been just constantly churning, 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 churning post championship, mm-hmm. they wanted to actually build a core that would stay together. That's great in theory, but I think we've seen this team does have certain role playing limitations. You got Luca and KP in the bubble, making the only team with two guys to make the all bubble team. Luca first team, KP second team. That's awesome, nice. but it also kind of exposes when you think about it that they went what three and five in the bubble yeah yeah it's like yeah what's that say about the rest of the rest of the team the rest Mm -hmm. of the role players largely did not show up certainly not with consistency and uh yeah there's something dallas has to figure out like moving forward they will use those data points you were talking about one thing i think they should do is definitely look at bringing back next year trey burke i think i I thought it was a bit of a mistake to necessarily let him go after uh last Mm -hmm. offseason him being part of that kp trade but I think yeah. he definitely brings a little bit of that secondary ball handler role that Dallas really needs. And I think Luca will thrive a little bit off that too. If he's not constantly doing step back threes for his three point looks, which <laughs> in a good game, he might only take four in a, in a game where he decides he's trigger happy or tired and thinks that, well, that's the only way I'm going to get a clean shot off against this defense for whatever moment. Then, mm-hmm. he, then in those cases, he's taken seven, eight, nine, like it can get out there and crazy. So if you actually just look at him like spotting up for three, he's nails this year. And it's yeah. almost like even he goes like, oh, pff, this is the easiest look I've had since shoot around. <laughs> like it, it's just, it's a breeze to him. It seems like, like he converts. I don't have the percentage in front of me. I really, if someone knows it, feel free to throw it in the comments. Cause I'm very curious to know what his actual spot up three point percentage is this year. But I swear it feels yeah. like it's like 60% or something like that. And, yeah. Trey has, Trey has really surprised me. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I was, I was, I was a four pro Trey Burke type player, especially at the end of last year. Mm-hmm. I even went as far as saying that I probably liked him uh, over Brunson. Um, Brunson. Yeah. Uh, but Brunson, he, he he stepped up a little bit more this year, so I, I'm excited to get him back. Yeah. As well, but if he can have Trey Burke as that third uh, point guard coming back next year, I right? Because you won't have Maria back. back anyway. Yeah, he's probably retired and done after I th- this I year. Think so. so yeah. Yeah. So uh, that definitely to your point, I definitely agree with that, that um, Trey Burke is definitely a, a player. How many times have I said definitely? <laughs> but he's, he, he's, I was about to say definitely again, but he's, he's, he's a player that I was mentioned a definite number of times. A definite number of times. Definitely. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, he, he's, he is a player that I would like to see back in the Mavs uniform for sure next year. For yeah. sure. So definitely with this matchup specifically, we've already talked about how this is, probably as unideal, less than ideal of a matchup that you could have possibly drawn. And yeah. you you were trying to avoid it. You couldn't really do it because you let a couple of those bubble games. I needed, you really had I really, needed, all of those bubble I, games were winnable except needed, for the last Phoenix I needed one, the you nuggets, yeah. I needed the nuggets to win. I need there was like so many every every game I was looking, I was always looking at the standings. I was like, okay, how 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 many games are we behind for the six feet? Yeah. How many games are we? How many games is the Nuggets behind? The Nuggets were at one point were a game behind the Clippers, and I think that's they got to a half game at one point. Oh my gosh, dude! And I remember, it, well, I, I forgot which game it was, but it was a game where it was like, I mean, you're up we, seven on Houston with 49 seconds to go, and you lose that in overtime. That yeah, that one right there does games, it. You lose by the two first to Phoenix. Suns game, the first, the first Sun game, I that was like the first time I ever like threw something when the clock hit zero. Yeah, in a long time. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. So I mean, if we would have won those games, we probably would have saw ourselves in the sixth seed. Um, oh, for sure. Because it, yeah, it was just a cluster in the middle of the in the standing. So yep. I was hoping that the right teams would lose at the right time, and we can win the right number of games for us to at least move up one spot. Because it was, it was honestly it would have been easier for us to move up than move down to the eighth seed. Sure. If you want to give me the if you want to give me the option 
<laughs> to be like, you can stay where you are, or you could go down to the eight seed. Yeah, uh, I would have been like, I'll take the eight seed and play the Lakers, honestly. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, by winning a single nope. game in the bubble, they clinched a playoff spot. In fact, they clinched the seven seed <laughs> with a single win. And even then, they didn't yeah. even win to get it. Just someone else lost. So going into that yeah, Suns so, game, they had already clinched. Yeah. yeah, but like one of the games that the Grizzlies lost was like, hey, we're in. And everyone's yeah. like celebrating. It's like, okay, I mean, well, we didn't win. But okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. anyway, it's, so, it's still it's still good. It's still good to be in the playoffs. Don't get me wrong. Sure. Right. It, <laughs> this this is going to be valuable experience for a very young team. I was thinking about this earlier, how little playoff experience this team has. I mean, it, oh, yeah. I mean, Boban was on a playoff team last year. I think he might have also had a, a couple of years with the Clippers. Seth went to the West Finals. That's a legitimate one to call out. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, Barea was Barea. on a championship team. Uh, he's not playing, but Courtney Lee was on the Magic as a rookie when they went to the finals. So oh, yeah. there's that, but he didn't really have much of a role in it. I think he missed most of the playoffs and returned in the finals. And was, <laughs> they were that was like one of the storylines of that Lakers Magic uh, finals matchup was they were hoping that he could give some little spark to Orlando, who was just trying to hang on at that point. But yeah, yeah it's it's very limited on playoff experience for this. Seth is honestly, I would say, the best example in terms of a guy who can give you right now impact. I mean, you could say Mm Boban, but I I don't know if in this series you're going to get a lot of that. But they're going to have to do something. They're too small. They're too small and too physical. Yeah. Um, It's like the most... I mean, we can can possibly throw him in, but... It'll be small doses like his career has mostly been shown by. Yeah. He, He will get his 10 minutes, 10 points three, four, or five rebounds. Yep. But that's about as effective as it can be. Right. And the Mavericks are going to have to do something because in the last matchup we saw, we saw Zubak just absolutely eat them alive. Yeah. I mean, what was he, like 20-something I, points? I, and like, yeah, I think he had like 25 points. And yeah, it was like 25 points on like perfect or something like that. 10 of 10 or 10 of a, or 11 of 11. It was like the yeah. only game like that in NBA history where it was like a perfect shooting percentage Across the board, I do think he actually missed a free throw. I think he was one of two at the line or something <laughs> like that. But if you had added up all of his makes, you would have had like 10 feet of total distance. Like everything yeah. was right there at the rim. Putbacks, easy, chip-ins. And that's where I was bringing up even the possibility of like Boban seeing a little bit more time of like, okay, we have to rebound better because they killed us on offensive rebounding inside. Zubak ate us alive. And you're talking about a guy that averages like seven and a half boards. For them, yeah, seven and a half rebounds is his average. By comparison, yeah. KP is nine and a half, Luca's nine point four. So it's like, okay, the Clippers as a as a team are not super high in the rebounding. Um well actually, you know what? I say that. I guess as a team they just rebound very efficiently, because as a team, mm-hmm. it looks like they're third overall in rebounding, whereas the Mavericks are also pretty high in the rebounding as a team department, it looks like. Um, they did. They did. Fourth. They did improve this year in the hey. rebounding department because that used to be an Achilles heel. Yes. For the Mavericks and the what we <laughs> one of the things we need to get better on is situational rebounding because for some reason, whenever the going gets tough, and we re- hey, we just need one stop, Houston, one rebound. Get a Houston, rebound on a I, on a missed free throw. You know is going to be missed, exa- and the game exa- is over. Exactly. I can. I, I I can't tell you how many times I can see it off my head, but I can remember just a bunch of times when the Mavericks back in the days, um, probably in those four years that we didn't make the playoffs, yeah. was always, hey, we're, we need to get this rebound, get, you know, fouled, whatever. We always failed to get the rebound. It always was something that really pissed me off. But we did fix the re- – it used to be like across the board we're just bad at rebounding. Yeah. But now we at least got better at rebounding, but the situation needs right. to get a little better now. Yeah. So, I mean, improvement. Well, I mean, you're going to have to, yeah, you're going to have to glass control the full. glass in this situation. Like, you're, yeah. you know, from a historic standpoint, yeah. the most efficient offense in NBA history, but a lot of that is dictated by how many threes we shoot, the way yeah. that formula works, the way that's weighted. So, as a team shooting threes, the Mavericks shoots, looks like 36.7% as a team from three. Uh, opponents, okay. meanwhile, this season have shot 35.1% from three against Dallas. The Clippers are going to be one of those teams that can break that for sure. For sure. Mm-hmm. They've got more than enough firepower there. Um, yeah. If you look at, I, I think this was uh, Nick Angstad on Twitter, um, although I think he was citing um, another stat, um, someone else that he saw the stat from, but it basically was showing like the balance of Kawhi Leonard's 
offensive attack and like there's nowhere that he shoots more than 29% of his field goal attempts from whether you're talking about right at the rim versus mid range versus long mid range versus three like he mm-hmm. he's very balanced in how he shoots and there was only like the long mid range where his shooting percentage was just below league average like mm-hmm. very insanely balanced on that front Meanwhile, you got Paul George over there who I don't know how he finished out bubble play, but I do know uh, at the start of the bubble, he was like a flamethrower from three, um, just raining down three-pointers left and right. I and think so, he was that against us too, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that that's something you're going to have to prepare for. And then you got Lou Williams, you know, perennial six-man guy, 18 points off the bench. Harrell, who I think is actually um, – He's back. Yeah, he's yeah, going to be back he in is time back. for game one. And that's another guy hopefully, who you're gonna have. Hopefully he'll be rusty. Right now. He's not an outside guy, but still, there's there's a yeah. lot to have to deal with here. What I think is interesting is there's been a lot of people wanting Dallas to like fix your defense, fix your defense, fix your defense. I agree, but I I think in terms of like fixing your defense, you need to batten down in like certain circumstantial situations. Because mm-hmm. you didn't get here on the back of your defense. Your 16th, mm-hmm. I think, overall in the league as a defense, which is actually much higher than I thought they would have been. God knows what they <laughs> are in relation to the bubble where the lowest point yeah. total they gave up was 117. But th- Last, th- probably. you didn't make the postseason <laughs> on the back of your defense. You did it on being an insanely efficient offense. And so I think with that in mind, while you will in some situations throw in like a MKG or something to try and – slow down certain things like if you got a guy just cooking you maybe try to see if you can somewhat s- slow them down a little bit or at least make them work harder for the points they're getting i think you really need to just throw out your most efficient offensive weapons as much as you can and just try mm-hmm. and lean on the back of your historic offense like if even you are touting on like social media right now that your offense is the all-time most uh, efficient offense ever great your game plan should probably lean on that instead of saying you know hey let's focus more on slowing them down and trying to slow things down because it's a young team and sometimes you just want to slow things down to try and avoid the nerves and mistake i say pedal to the metal that's that's my yeah game. what do you think that's definitely a a, a, a solid approach I, I, I would say um definitely one way we should, because you are correct we didn't get here on the back of our defense and uh we do not match up well with what they have offensively like we can't we we can't throw bodies like if we wanted to stop like we probably have dorian finney smith to guard Kawhi. yep um i don't even know if you want to even throw maxi at paul like that's like probably he's probably like our second best outside outside i'm not throwing an nkg because he's not a uh uh rotational player as of yet unless carlisle just i think made he'll, his i think decision. he'll jump over jack he has he has to he has to be yeah. Um, so, I mean, just so like, let's, let's go ahead and throw him in there. He's probably like our second best perimeter defender. Uh, and then Maxi's our third a, or a close, a close third, honestly. So uh, we don't have the body and that's pretty much it in terms of good perimeter defenders. Now we just got to throw in uh high, um, you know, high effort type players, but yep. you know, that's all we have. We don't have a lot of bodies to throw. At their at their main threat, do we, who who do we have to stop Lou Williams? Who do we have to um, stop you know, Montrez? Uh, I mean, and yeah. if we do stop them, there's always someone else. Like we we played, I think last time we played the Clippers, we did the best we could do against Kawhi. I think he still had like what thirty points or something like that. Yeah, he got cooking but late it, for sure, especially when they yeah. played in the fourth quarter halfway through. Yeah, that I yeah, would say through, from a perimeter defense thing, I think Trey Burke has been very good even on that end in the bubble i think you saw a lot of energy and effort from him that translated to steals and fast breaks the other way and so i'm not saying he's a good defender in general i think that's someone who as we were kind of talking about him earlier and what he can provide to the offense and his outside Mm shooting has also been very good in the bubble uh i think that's Mm -hmm. something he can bring and you do see flashes every now and then from hardaway on doing something defensively Defense. but he's not really but yeah it's, a good it's not something that we can well, yeah it's not something that we can count on. and that's probably who we'll probably throw on paul george to be honest with you yeah but uh i mean like i said the matchup wise we don't match up well with him so i do i i will subscribe to your to your i guess game plan if you're if you're coaching the mavericks to just hey just go off of the back of our 
offense and let's just try to just use our, our firepower. My thing is where I get worried is we get too damn happy. Three point happy. We get more yeah. out of control and it's like the ball. Yeah, if we miss like two or three in a row, it's just like, okay, let's just – and this was this was the blessing that freaking Dirk brought to it where I, if we can get KP, and that's something that he needs to – look, one thing KP needs to be working on all offseason – is a, a solid post up game where he can it can be somewhat reliable. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not it's not reliable now, but I, I still want to utilize it just so we can switch up our attack a little bit. Um, but if we can, like imagine because we we've had all those times that we've you know forty point first quarters uh, and then you will we'll completely turn the game around at the end at the at well, of course in the third quarter. And then we'll go on for stretches where we're not scoring. That's because we'll get so three happy. Yeah. And it's like Luca drives in and then he tries to kick it at Maxi or Dorian or Tim for the three. And it's not falling. Back in the day when our shots weren't falling, even though they're they're more like 15 footers and stuff like that, we would just calm down, calm down the offense, simplify it, throw it to Dirk in the post. And and you know, let's at least stop the run by getting a two point bucket by relying on Dirk. Now we don't have a Dirk now. We have a player that can be a Dirk light type player mm-hmm. in, in KP. So that's something that we should probably, uh, I guess, try to do. Once we get in those slumps that we're inevitably going to get, if, we, if we're so reliant on the three-point basket, you know, every now and then we'll have a Mother's Day massacre where everything is falling. Yeah. But we cannot, we can't count on that. Right. You know what I mean? Um, playoff basketball, you know, Mother's Day, you know, we yeah. don't, we don't, we don't remember when that happens in the regular season. Anyway, I'm just so excited for playoff basketball. But anyway, yeah, we can't, we can't count on that. So when the shots are not falling, we got to be able to switch up our offense, um, switch up our attack. Luke could drive in all the way, uh, or just hey, give it to KP. Try to get him um, situated lower in the in the post. Try to get a switch where we get a smaller guy on him give it to him so he can do his quick little turnaround and, and get some shots up in the, in the, I want to say low post, mid to low post, just so we can, we can get, get some buckets up. I mean, we see this um, when it gets to, when it gets to crunch time. And I do think this is one of the reasons why we have a problem with closing games is we, we are so two dimensional in terms of our, our offensive attack. We're, it's like, we're like, the, we're like the Rockets literally where it's either yeah. threes or layups where I believe if we, at the end of the games, it's like, okay, toss all analytics aside. We just need buckets right. any way we can. It doesn't matter if high it's a two. Yeah, high percentage. Yeah, I mean, I don't, honestly, if you, we just need our bucket getters to get buckets. That's it. Yeah. Uh, just like we saw, yes, we saw it yesterday with the Blazers versus uh, Memphis when a game got close at the end. Hey, give it to McCollum. McCollum had John Moran on him and he was shooting low percentage high uh, two pointers, but they were going in. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I mean, just switching up our attacks, and I think Luca can do that. Um, you know, by taking this guy off the off the off the dribble and using his size and strength. Um, but also, we need, we need to utilize Tim Hardaway more. I mean, ho- hopefully, he's comfortable enough in the offense to be like, okay, uh, hey man, you don't need to shoot threes the whole time. Yeah. Um, get yourself going by getting some 15 footers in. We'll set some screens for you. And you just go in and pull up. Seth is also a very good mid-range shooter mm-hmm. as well. Trey has actually been pretty solid at the mid-range game as well. And I know that's a dying art, but with you as a defender, because this is how I look at it. Because uh, you know, back when we played in high school, I was I was more of a defense a defense type player. Mm-hmm. And how I will look at it is, if I'm guarding someone that's two dimensional, I'm always going to shoot threes and in layups. As soon as you get past the three point line. I'm not worried about you doing anything else except uh, putting up a layup. So it's easier to guard you. But if if you are um, somewhat proficient at hitting, you know, 15 foot jump shots, I'm still guessing on what you're doing mm-hmm. as you're attacking the basket. So I right. can't. And trying to time to a contest one. and positioning yeah, and all of that. Exactly. So I can't fully commit to one thing. Um, you know, especially especially if Luca, people would want to dream about this. If Luca got a, a more reliant mid range game, because uh-huh. Luca is such a great counter basketball player. Like he will make a move, defense makes a move, and he's really good at countering it. Yeah. So 
no one, if he drives in, you can still, for how he's playing, how he's been playing in the bubble, it's I can fully commit to Luca going for a layup once he gets past the three point line. Uh-huh. But if he develops a mid range game, I can't fully commit to anything Luca's doing. And so I'm just going to have to guess and hopefully I guess right. And if I guess too soon, Luca's going to freaking counter it and he's going to get either an M1 or something, which he's good at doing it now. But he's he's good at doing it now with only being a a two tooled uh, scoring threat. Yeah, you know what I mean. So imagine if he added another tool in his in his tool belt, he will be a freaking monster. That yeah, that's so, a good, that's and, a good call out for sure. And mm-hmm. yeah, I mean he he had a floater game a lot in his rookie year, and he actually shot a pretty decent percentage at it from what I recall. Yep. And I think he mm-hmm. he still used it early in this year, I want to say, but eventually it did kind of fall out of his rotation. And yeah. I don't know if there's a reason for that or anything. If the Mavericks just decided, hey. We're going to value, you know, the Rockets mentality where it's everything's the right at the rim or it's a three. Or you could say Luca specifically going, I think you mentioned in the pregame, you know, full hearted mm-hmm. basically in his attack approach. Really, if he's driving to the basket, yeah, you're right. He's either going all the way for a layup, which he converts or at he's a passing great it out. percentage. Yeah, or, or he's kicking it to the corner. Yeah. Yep. And I, I think uh, I think that's good in the sense that he, he kept him honest. He keeps him honest that way by, you know, hitting his spot up shooters and all that. Like you saw in that Bucks game, he was controlling mm-hmm. the game late and he wasn't even having to take any shots towards the end. He was just kicking out yep. to Dorian Finney Smith. When your shooters are making shots, it keeps everything wide open because Luca had already established yeah. his ability to finish inside. And the mm-hmm. Bucks are a big physical team in that regard. So, but your guys are not going to do that. You can't count on your guys to do that. Every, exactly. Every game. It's what the role players are able to do in terms of knocking down shots because Luca will find you in that Bucks game. The average uh, distance of space between the shooter for the Mavericks and the defender was, I think just a hair under six feet, like basically converting or giving him wide open shots constantly throughout the game. That's mm-hmm. what precision passing can do for you. But yeah, you got to have the guys that can knock down those shots because if they're not knocking down those shots, then suddenly those contests for Luca at the rim get that much more brutal. Like you're going to have mm-hmm. defenses really collapsing at that point because they know, hey, they're shooting like we saw. What was it? The uh, the Jazz game, I think it was, where the Mavericks were started out like – no, it wasn't the Jazz game. Um, the Kings game where they started 4 of 20. I knew it was one of those purple teams where they started uh, 4 <laughs> of 20 on threes. And, Just gosh darn purple teams. Yep, stupid purple teams. <laughs> Where, goes, God damn, the <laughs> where they started out uh, four of 20 shooting from three as a team. And the whole thing was just kind of felt like a brutal grind. And it's because the three point shot is such a you know vital cog to the Mavericks identity as a team that it's like mm-hmm. for them to win a game in which they shot, I think like sub 30 from three, I think it was like 22% in that game from three. I mean, mm-hmm. that was such an, uh, an anomaly in itself for them to win a game like that. But that's that's just what it is. Like Luca converts at a great percentage at the rim, but if the outside shooters aren't doing anything, then the defense is basically going to start daring them to do something. And in the meantime, they're going to make life jazz, for Luca. That was at the a jazz rim. game. That was a jazz game. Is that correct? That was a jazz game we're talking about. Uh, that was the Kings game where they started four of twenty the and then ended up winning an OT. Okay, the jazz game is when had no Luca or uh, KP. Luca, KP, and I, I was seeing uh, Tim and Seth. They were taking a lot yeah. more mid-range jumpers too and i was i was really happy Hardaway about attacked that the basket a lot early in that game like he was yeah. going all the way to the rim which i like but you won't i mean mm-hmm. yes gobert was on the floor so you could say like well they did have a stellar rim protector in that case but mm-hmm. i like the aggressive yeah. nature of it i like how some of these guys who you really need them cooking you gotta you gotta get them going early because in the last game against the clippers yeah you had your your main guys do work right like luca was 29 Six assists and three rebounds. So for him, that's a downer night because mm-hmm. he set such a ridiculously high bar standard. Yeah. K- KP, though, in 38 minutes was 30 points, nine rebounds, five assists, nine of 19 shooting. Um, so, yeah, you your main guys are doing work. But guys, you really need to step up. You didn't have Curry in that game, but you mm-hmm. needed Tim Hardaway Jr. to be your third guy. And in 36 minutes, he gave you eight points and three boards. Three of nine shooting, eight of his shot attempts were threes. That's not gonna. That's not gonna do it. Like you need that third guy there, and especially it's usually we talk about this. You never get a game where it's hard. Uh, 
I mean, obviously, we just got one against the Jazz, but they were literally the two scoring options on the floor. Hardaway yeah. and Curry are never cooking at the same time. So you need someone to step up and be that third man. Hell, in the Bucks game, it ended up being Dorian Finney-Smith, who was the third guy in yeah. terms of production. <laughs> uh, first game, it he's was been having those games. Trey Burke. He's kind, he's kind of like, he's kind of like a, a mini uh, bubble breakout, honestly. Yeah, Dorian yeah, Finney-Smith. yeah, he, for sure. For sure, he was one of those mm-hmm. surprise guys. He for, uh, Dorian Finney-Smith was fantastic throughout the bubble. I think the first game yeah. against Houston was ho-hum, um, you know, by, by which I mean pretty much his regular production. Um, Mm -hmm. compared to the regular season. But yeah, after that, he was like 12, 18, 27, 16, Mm -hmm. like very good stuff. And, you know, who knows? He he might have had the game-winning shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, That's a foul not being called. Of course, Dame could have shot a full-court shot with .5 on the (laughs) clock and made it with the way he played. But... Yeah, it's true. Yeah, so <laughs> and, and you have to guard it too. Like you couldn't just like, all right, Dame, just shoot it. Yeah, from exactly. Half, from from beyond half court. Yeah, like, no, nope, he's still he a threat. It he, like it was, he's still a threat. Guard him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, that was amazing. So the Mavericks need that third guy cooking, and in this game, the one twenty six one eleven defeat. You know they were tied at one on one all with six minutes to go. KP had mm-hmm. had a, a strong fourth quarter, hit back to back threes. Uh, his, his other bucket was, uh, I think, an and one on a turnaround, if I'm not mistaken. But what I liked in that game in particular is you saw KP being more aggressive. I think you're seeing mm-hmm. him diving down to the basket and getting those drop-off, uh, little dump-off passes, whether it's from Luka or whatever, and just ferocious finishes at the rim. That yeah. That's what you need from him. You need him to you know, be able to extend the floor. Yeah, he was 3 of 7. Um, shooting threes in this game so it wasn't like it was it was efficient like he was stretching the floor you know you're shooting nearly 50 percent but Mm -hmm. you need you need a balanced attack and sometimes with these more physical teams particularly in the playoffs where things are allowed to get a little bit more physical you Mm -hmm. know it happened with Dirk a lot in his career for a while too teams get more physical with you and kind of push you out of like push you away from the basket basically and make you that's the game that that's the game plan for guys like yes And especially, yeah. and especially with KP, I mean, um, mm-hmm. just just his frame and everything. You know, he's not like a Boban frame, um, but mm-hmm. of course, that's what makes him the unicorn and his ability to be so fluid with his motions and do step backs and things like that. But yeah, it, I mean, it just bears repeating. If you have a third guy, and your main two guys have to do work, but if you have a third guy stepping up, then you actually can keep their their defense more honest and. You know, I, I think um, I think one thing the Mavericks have missed, even though KP, as I mentioned in the dive downs, has certainly helped keep defenses a little bit more honest, um, is the, is that elite lob threat. And as maligned as yep. Dwight Powell was within the Mavericks fan base, that's something in his game that has always been very good, particularly the last couple of years, his ability mm-hmm. to pick and roll and finish lob dunks. Um, it, it really opened things up with the Mavericks offense. And once he went out, while it's kind of a catch 22, because that was the rise of KP, it, mm-hmm. it did eliminate an, an elite aspect from a very good offense already. So mm-hmm. we'll see. I mean, it, it kind of goes as well to that narrative I was talking about, about the ability to kick out to guys um, for three point shooters. And if they're not hitting, you still didn't just have Luca to worry about. You also had to worry about like a lob threat or if you, had to, you know, collapse down on Luca as he was driving and then opened up the guy on the back end, things like that. But it's uh it's going to be tough. This is going to be a very difficult yeah. matchup because in every scenario I try to envision, I find it hard to envision that if they steal a couple games, I will be so delightfully tickled and consider every everything else gravy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like we're kinda of, we're kinda of playing with house cars, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, is it how the saying goes? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so I mean, we, I don't want to say we have no expectations, or it's it's not like it's different than 2016 or any of those teams after 2011, to where it's like, all right, we made the playoffs. It's kind of like, okay, that it's almost routine, but we had zero expectations and it kind of like uh, nothing to really look forward to in the future. But like now is like, okay we know the purpose of this playoffs is these are, it's a good experience to get for a team that's up and coming. We got a bunch of 
younger guys who are being led by younger guys. We're not really that young of a team, but we are, we're being led. Yeah. We're inexperienced. We're being led by younger guys. Yeah. So, um, so it's good. Um, it's good experience for guys like Luca and KP to get. So that's one of the things we're excited about. So hopefully, and I've said this I've probably like three or four times throughout this whole podcast, is just, we just need to get the right data points for them to know what they need to work on, what they need to expect, and uh, different things that they need to round out their game to a more, to a more uh, efficient level. One thing that KP should probably work on aside from uh, post-up, he, I I'm not sure if it's just me, but I feel like KP is not that good of a shooter from the corner. Is it just me? Mm, I can't think of many times he's even attempted those shots. But then again, yeah, I can't think of many times, times Dirk did prior to that either. Yeah, that was, I remember that was, at a, the that was a spot Dirk for some reason wasn't a huge fan of. He was usually the wing extended or the top of the key. Yeah, so Trailing especially especially if Dwight when Dwight came back, I think that's where I'm not I'm not 100 certain. I'm trying to literally go from memory, but. I think that's where a lot where KP was when Dwight was the five. And yeah. I think it was like KP was in the corner on the opposite end or something like that. I definitely so think they put him around the, the arc more when, when Dwight mm-hmm. was here. And, you know, I get what they were trying to do, but it, it kind of didn't work as well for him. And then once mm-hmm. he moved to the five, it kind of moved him around a little bit more. And you can still you know, put him out there a little bit on the three point line, but you didn't just have him mm-hmm. camping out. And I think that opened yeah. things up a little bit more. And because and, he was I mean, more Dwight, active and moving, it helped him get yeah. into the flow of things better. And Dwight is a little proficient from the three point line. So you can switch it up a yeah. little bit. I mean, it's not like Dwight's like a, it's not a freaking, you know, point or like a 10% three point shooter. I think he was somewhat decent, probably low thirties, but still, yeah. I mean, it was enough to where you had to, respect him a little bit like you can't right. give him a wide open shot he will make a wide open one at a pretty decent clip so right and we could probably switch it up and white power gets back so i think i think what the the beginning of the season was was um kp was probably just trying shaking to kill his way rust. out with huh shaking off rust for sure yeah for sure so i think the if, if we got this later version of kp with the beginning of the year, Dwight, I think it will work a lot better, honestly. It, it I, might. I think it It'll be interesting to see, you know, with the season coming around next year as early as Christmas, then, yeah, mm-hmm. it'll be interesting to see how that stacks up. One note I see awesome here Christmas. that'll be interesting as well in this particular matchup, the Clippers, in terms of, like, where they rate as a team in assists, they're 22nd, which I believe is the lowest of the Western Conference playoff teams. Um, I could be wrong on that. But it's pretty yeah, yeah. low, regardless. You're talking 30 teams, and they're in the bottom 10. Uh, that Mavericks, makes sense. Kawhi, Kawhi is not that much of a playmaker, and, if and your neither is Paul George, and lot. neither is Lou Williams. Yeah. It's a like yeah. a Lou Williams leads the team in assists with 5.6. Like, oh gosh, okay. Yeah, like they are very much a team that likes to go one on one, and because we don't mm. have those perimeter defenders, I think that adds more importance then on the rebounding. And if you mm. look back to the game against them. Um, on the sixth, which was in the bubble, Dallas got out rebounded 45 37. Offensive boards was pretty even, nine and eight, but you've got to win the rebounding battle because you're talking about a team with a lot of firepower to throw. Like in that game, you didn't even have Harold. Lou Williams wasn't mm-hmm. quite 100% yet, and it was a slow game. That, was, from that was his first game back from right. quarantine. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, it was a slow. And it was a slow start as well. I think it was for Kawhi in that game um, mm-hmm. as well. Or it may, we're it, just maybe getting eaten up I by, can't remember which one of them, but it I was, think it was Kawhi. Okay, I remember. Yeah, I think it was Kawhi. It was just like Zubac was the one eating us up. Yeah, um, yeah, he the, absolutely the obliterated game. us. He was frustratingly so. Twenty-four minutes, twenty-one points, fifteen rebounds, ten of ten Jesus from Christ. the field. <laughs> One assist, yeah, one block. Can't let that His only miss, one of two at the line. Uh, just yeah, we can't we can't have that happen. Yeah, you cannot <laughs> you cannot allow them to beat you rebounding. Like if you actually get a stop on defense, you have to actually secure the rebound. Yeah. And that I mean that's going to be key for them. They're not a team that mm-hmm. forces a lot of turnovers. The Mavericks aren't, and mm-hmm. they certainly don't generate a lot of steals. Obviously, that goes hand in hand with the turnovers. 
But yeah. that that is huge. You got a team that likes to go one on one. You're not known as a defensive stopper team, so you better damn well get the ball and go the mm-hmm. other way. And yep. yeah, that that's going to be a huge facet here like against that blazers matchup there you saw they didn't close out the first quarter or i think even second quarter very well and it was Mm -hmm. even luca who has to be the calming presence for us as much as possible but just sloppy with the ball careless turnovers where you're just getting ripped by the guy guarding you or uh getting stripped as you're driving or trying to pass and it's going the other direction you cannot you can't have that happen like I, I know I talked earlier about this team needing to lean on the offense and be pedal to the metal. There's a difference mm-hmm. between pedal to the metal and out of control. And I yeah. think generally Luca is very good at managing the game, being kind of a floor general when he needs to be. I uh-huh. think that's something that might get tested a little bit here just because of the inexperience. Like if he mm-hmm. feels that pressure, um, be it from a slow start in this game, like the Clippers jump out early or whatever. I think that might put some added pressure where suddenly you see, and if, if things are going wrong, where suddenly he's rushing things a little bit or whatever, and you see the Mavericks with a high turnover count. They're one of the best teams in the league on fewest turnovers, but in a lot of these games that they blew in the bubble, you can see, blew in the bubble, that's funny. Um, <laughs> you see a lot of those games had high turnovers. Like, let me see this particular one here. I want to look back at this Clippers game. Uh, in this game, they had... No, you know what? This game was actually great. Seven turnovers. They did a great job in that game. You need that. You need something... Mm-hmm. No more than like a dozen turnovers in a game. The Blazers game had 17. So, oh. yeah. You cannot be that reckless with the ball. And I think uh, in other games we talked about where they should have secured a win. Um, yeah, the Rockets game that opened it had 20. Jeez. When you protect the ball, you have to protect the ball and you have to secure the rebounds. That's mm-hmm. what you have to bank on because you don't have a defense. You have guys that can be good in like isolated incidents and a couple guys that have some versatility, but you don't have as a team a good defense. So I would say that's the big thing for the Mavericks in this first game. I think it's critical that they steal one of the first two games. We're neutral court, right? So mm-hmm. the, the seeding doesn't really no- matter other than who you're facing off with. Um, yeah, because who cares what logo they put on the freaking court? Oh, there's 300 <laughs> digital fans. They'll give a slight uh, a slight advantage in the number of Clipper fans there. Even, All right, well you're playing yeah, in front, of, in front of 300 people that aren't actually there versus yeah. 20,000 or whatever it is. So mm-hmm. yeah, it, it's drastically different. So neutral court, great, but I still think because you're a young team, just like I said, it's important, particularly in game one, that I think you don't fall behind big early in the game mm-hmm. i think in the series if they fall behind 0-2 i think they're really really gonna have a hard time uh avoiding 0-3 and then at that mm-hmm. point you know you're basically in the all right can you get one at least territory yeah sweep or sweep or gentleman sweep yeah um, so but i mean it's incumbent it's incumbent on them yeah uh to to try to steal as many possessions as they can. This is where Dorian Finney Smith is really important. Mm-hmm. Um, not only for his defense, but his ability to get offensive rebounds. He's well, I, he, I know we're talking about uh, X factors or whatever. Him, Maxi are 1A and 1B one, one in terms of X factors. Like these are the, one of the guys that we need to step up. Yeah, I understand in terms of Curry and Hardaway. We need you guys to hit threes. We need you guys to get buckets by any means necessary. But um, if we want to win games, the things that we need to focus on is, you know, securing rebounds. Yes, for sure. Like, that's paramount that we need to do that. Like, it's more important than anything. If it was the Rockets, like, yeah, get rebounds or whatever. But um, here we need to get rebounds. And we also need to get offensive rebounds, too. Yeah, um, and, and that's Dodo where has been great that's on like a, that. He's that's his that's his specialty. Yep. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I agree. If uh, if they're able to do that and they can get at least one to two guys stepping up, and I'm not saying you got to have someone go off like uh, Dodo did against the Bucks, where it's like 27 mm-hmm. and 15 or something crazy like that, and six made threes. You don't have to get yeah. that. I mean, obviously, if you get it, fantastic. Mm-hmm. 
but you need one to two guys to step up above their usual production level and to hit big shots. And Maxi has hit some big shots as well mm-hmm. in the bubble. He just hasn't gotten quite the same shine from it as Dodo got in a couple moments. Uh, yeah. whether it was Maxi 16, still doesn't get Maxi still box. doesn't get the proper respect that he deserves. Like people still think they can take him off the dribble, and he's like, "All right, and yeah." I, honestly, I hope he never gets it because. People literally, legitimately, like think they're just gonna take him off the dribble, and oh, he's like right him. there. Yeah, and he's like, yeah. nope, sorry, sir. Freaking destroys him. Yeah, I love it. He turned in, he turned into a little bit of a goon too. What, what game was, was that? The Blazers the game. The Blazers game where At he was. End? Yeah, he was jawing with a, a bunch of the Blazers. Yeah, yeah I, I loved that. it. I loved it. I was like, all right, all right. He's turned into one of those, uh, one of the goon yep. type guys. Like, all right, Max, I see you. Yeah. We need a Bash brother in there because we had absolutely no one. Like, no I thought one did watching be... that was like Maxi never talks. So what the hell did they say to Maxi? <laughs> what do you got to say to get <laughs> yeah. Maxi pissed off enough to start jawing with you? <laughs> exactly. Dude. But yeah, hopefully well, he can that... carry some of that attitude in because they're going to need it because these teams are going to. I mean, hell, they have, dude, Marcus Morris isn't going to be one of those guys really trying to get in Luca's head or get in. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you're going to have Marcus Morris. You're going to have is Pat Bev available or is he still hurt? I don't think he's immediately available, but he's he's. I think he's day to day was what I had seen. Let me take a look. Hmm. Um, Knowing our luck, he will probably be good to go for game one. Probably that that would be uh, very fitting for sure. Mm-hmm. Let's see. I don't see any notes with him listed, so I guess he's available. My dog literally kicked the door open. Oh wait, he's yeah, he's day to day for his calf injury. Mm, okay. Uh, Shamit also day to day, and Harold's listed as day to day, but his says for personal. Didn't he? Yeah, he he's he gonna like he's gonna be. I think. I think so. Something yeah. like that. I think it was personally. So um, he just arrived at the bubble. Um, I think last week, okay. and his so he's, he'll his be, quarantine. Yeah. His quarantine will be done yeah. in time for game one. So he yeah, should be active for sense. game one. Well, the game is uh, 8 p.m. Central time tomorrow, Monday night. Uh, the Clippers are favored currently by six. Obviously, the line will move plenty between now and then. And uh, mm-hmm. the over-under is 230.5 points. Mavericks have to, uh, have to hope that that holds because... They're going to need to score. During the regular season, they averaged something like 117 a game. Uh, third mm-hmm. highest scoring in the league per team. Now, we talked earlier about the efficiency. That's different than just points per game purely. Um, so they got to they gotta really hope that they can do that. But if you look at how they've been doing since January with KP starting to really, really figure things out, then, yeah, you, you can see it. And he's played well in the couple matchups with the Clippers in this side of the year. So that's something to be hopeful about as well as far as that. You got your main two guys that you're just going to have to count on and everything else is just you got to find one or two if you're somehow lucky enough for it to happen, three guys that can step up and make some plays. And it might just come down to hustle or energy plays, whether it's Dorian Finney-Smith grabbing a huge offensive rebound or whatever. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I one thing, we talked about this uh, before the season even started. Um, and I, and I mentioned it the other day as well, but you know, you being on with me for the show here, I wanted to kind of go over it again. You see some people who are viewing this as like, all right, well you're in the playoffs. You got to win at least a couple games for this to like amount to anything. I disagree entirely. Like we, we talked before the season started. I think at best we had them, uh, right at like the eight seed like i know i I had him at 44 Mm -hmm. wins i mean if you want to be a smart ass which of course i do uh they got 43 (laughs) so you could say like damn ddp you were you were spot on pretty much so basically we can blame you for the whole pandemic yeah well not the bad bad stuff i mean not that there's good stuff in yeah no everything everything yeah Uh, okay well, I don't know if I'd go that far with it, but uh, every every aspect of this pandemic is on. I'll DDP take the blame for the Mavericks win total in the sense that I was actually proven damn near spot on. No, correct. in order in order for in order for your prediction to be damn well spot on, we needed a, a global pandemic plus everything else to happen in order for it to in order for it 
Bro, I don't, I don't know my own power. I can't help it. <laughs> it is all your fault there. Gosh darn you. Uh, that's so much anyway. guilt dumped onto my head, man. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I had 43 wins, and I said, like, I thought they were just outside of the playoff picture. The year before was 48 yeah. wins to get in as the eighth seed. And I said, I imagine they'll have to make a move at the deadline. That'll bring in another scorer, another, like, consistent third guy. And then at that point, I could see them making a push all the way to seven, as high as seven. Well, they didn't make the trade, but they were better than I thought in terms of Luka. And, you know, after January came around, KP. And as a result of that, they got 43 wins and they locked down the seventh seed. Great. Mm -hmm. A return to the playoffs with this team, with Luka being an all-star, with KP being, um, you know, breaking out after the Dwight injury, unfortunately, for Dwight. I think that was like January 21st or something like that, or 28th was when Dwight went down. But that, mm-hmm. that all to me amounts is like, all right, you get your foot in the door, you're in the playoffs. Now, by no means am I saying, hey, if you get routed four straight times and you're just out of there, that it's worthwhile. I do think now that you're there, the picture does change a little bit. Like, you need to at least hang tight yeah. and be competitive. You don't learn anything just from getting your ticket punched and getting to go there and, you know, basically enjoy a four-game sweep on the yeah, bad side and, of it. And an extra, an it extra four games, yeah. Yeah, you've got to actually battle and you've got to show grit and heart in these games. And so mm-hmm. if you can steal, even if it's a five-game series, which it very well might be, I was actually surprised mm-hmm. how many people I've seen predict this series. I'm surprised I've yet to see anyone predicting a sweep. That's something at least. But uh, yeah. I think even if it's a five-game series, all right, fine, you get me the one win, you better damn well be right there for three of those other games. And if you do that, then I can see growth and understanding because, yeah, when a team has time to game plan for you all this time, know exactly Mm -hmm. everything you like to do, how to abuse your weaknesses, and then attacks you relentlessly on it and puts you out of your own game. They're oh, gonna they're gonna be going at Luca. Yes. Like, oh God, weird. yeah. They On said offense, they're going at Luca. Yes, they said before the the last bubble game against him, he is the head mm-hmm. of the snake. The Mavericks with their mm-hmm. you know historically efficient offense, he is literally the head of the snake. He's averaging nine assists. Mm-hmm. Actually, I think he's like eight point eight assists on the year. Um, was mm-hmm. what I saw on in the, the bubble. Side, what but is like he eight point eight nine assists, whatever. Um, in the bubble, he's like eleven, right? Yeah, in the bubble, he was higher than that for sure. He was like a eleven point two or something, um, but yeah. What a guy! You're you're talking about the head of the snake. You're talking about the guy that is the orchestrator of this historic offense. If you can be physical with him, if you can trap him and force the ball out of his hands, you're gonna make it hell mm-hmm. for him. And that's that's where your role players matter. That's why I mm-hmm. think Trey Burke for me is, you know, even though he came in literally signed right before the bubble. Mm-hmm. I think he is a huge X factor in this series. I think his importance almost can't be under, uh, under covered. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, Dorian Finney Smith, the maxi, I agree with you hundred percent. They need to have big series and especially Dodo. He'll get spot up three point looks because his reputation, even though he's been much better shooting threes this year, his reputation, I think around the league still carries that. He's not a great three point shooter based on the first three years of his career. So he'll get looks, but I think Burke, because of what he can do as a secondary ball handler and the way I expect the Clippers, especially if Luka can get going, the way I expect the Clippers to try and force the ball out of his hands a little bit, I think that's just going to be something where you have to have that secondary guy that can keep things going and kind of keep the Clippers' defense a little bit more honest. I totally agree. And for some reason, I did, I did forget about Trey Burke. Let me ask you. Do you start Trey Burke yes. ahead of Seth Curry? Yes. Wow. Okay. Curry. I do. Curry I do has done better that. for us this year. Whenever he's not been in the starting lineup for whatever reason, I can't remember a game where he started and had a big game. I think he does better mm-hmm. for us in that six-man role. Okay. Awesome. And I do agree with you. And here's and here's a huge reason why I agree with you. The, for in a big pe- in a big picture aspect of it. I think for health reasons, it is incumbent that we need to get a lot of load off of Luca in terms of the offense, especially how he's playing. Because one of one of the things that he hurts a lot is his ankle. Yeah. And if he's going to go in to the lane all the time, uh, all you need is one person to have their foot at the wrong place where Luca's about to land, 
boom, he's out for another, you know, how many games. We don't want that to happen. And a lot of time when he goes, I mean, we see it all the time. I don't know if it's him trying to be theatrical or whatever, but all the times that Lucas got hurt during a game, it's always him driving in or him being at the basket because people are swiping at him. People are trying to stop him by any means necessary because he is such a huge threat from, you know, within their restricted circle. Um, so, you know, the Clippers have bodies. Yeah. I'm like <laughs> they have bodies to just throw like they, um, one, I, I like how some people describe it is they have fouls to, to just throw around. Yeah. You know what I mean, you don't have to have, you know, your, your main guys getting, especially fouls, a team with that much depth. Yeah, I could toss in a Rodney McGruber, like, yo, if he goes in, you know, be physical with him. Like, probably not in the way of the Jordan rules, but, you know, it can be like Jordan light rules. You know what I mean? So be physical with him. So he did sign with Jordan Brand. He did, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, for, for, health, for health purposes, we do need a another person who can play make a little bit, who can get Luca some shots off the catch and shoot because yeah. he will be a far more better shooter that way. And then also just so we can, you know, keep him on the court longer. You know what I mean? Cause right. he, you know, people are, people are going to treat him a little bit more physically than the other guys. And I don't need to see Luke again hurt right. and hurting his, you know, future prospects and stuff like that. So right. Do you, I think it's something, what do you think that uh Lucas jump man logo is a layup? <laughs> he's got like 17 dunks on the year. <laughs> yeah, he does. And every time he dunks it, he's always like his, he hurts his wrist. I'm like, all right, dude. Yeah. Stop yeah. Don't dunk that, that pump fake pass to the corner, which he passes into the corner so much that just a pump fake sets the guy, gets the guys going. Yeah. Or that beautiful behind the back fake that he did against Milwaukee. Right. Like people, like people like throw their bodies he, out of the way. Bleacher Report like, called that. The uh, said he he rondoed them. I was like, you shut your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> you don't bring up that name in the context of our guy. Yeah, yeah. Heck no, man. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. Oh, yeah. I'm so, so glad I, mean, I tore yeah. up that jersey. <laughs> yeah, that was good times, bro. The rondo go bet back feels like days. so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, we go back to the days before the COVID where Derek Kirby was rocking Rondo jerseys. Because I lost the bet of last season. I don't th- I don't think we kept a running document this year, though, on like all of our predictions. No, I don't think we did. Too. Which is frustrating. I don't know why we wouldn't have, but, but we I, I remember like year, some sure. of them. Like I remembered the one I already said about the record uh, and the mm-hmm. playoff as it related to that. I know I had mm-hmm. KP averaging 26. He's like 20.4 points. Um, but considering he didn't get cooking until end of January, that I'm, you know, I think that's a pretty solid number for him. If you look at what he's doing in the bubble, I think that's more indicative of what he would do. And so, had you had that the whole season, I could certainly have seen him averaging 26 to 28 points a game, um, which you know, again, would be pretty nice. Uh, I, the, what I didn't expect was the leap forward for Luca, going up like 7.8 points better per game. Um, in yeah. that regard, that's what I didn't see. I thought Luca was going to be 24, 25 points per game. I thought KP would lead the team in scoring, and that you think was he's going to get case. the you think he's going to get the most improved player award? Uh, Luca getting most improved? Yeah, I don't. That that's such an interesting I, conversation about I whether honest, he should even be in the category. Like, I honestly think, I honestly think the reason why he's there is because is they because didn't put him they, in the top three for MVP. Yeah, they couldn't. Yeah, they couldn't put him in there. And they, I kind of got I that feel feeling like James, too. I I feel like putting James Harden in there was kind of a, I feel like it was a boost, a little bit because yeah. like, I mean he was doing work. Don't get me wrong. You know, if James Harden fans get word of what I'm about to say, <laughs> the Rocket Dude. Twitter account alone will come after you and call him the originator for a pass that's been and around he, since the like at least '60s. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, but. Like there wasn't a, there wasn't a ton of talk about James Harden being, you know, a top three candidate for MVP. I believe it, it was kind of switching around. I know Luca was Luca had that position for a long time uh-huh. before he got hurt. I believe the first time, um, he kind of dissipated after his first injury. Yeah, um, because he missed but, like ten I mean, games bit, or something. Yeah, exactly. And I think Kawhi was there for a little bit. James was there for a little bit, and I don't know, but it always felt like. 
James was kind of like out of the out of like the five or six people that everyone talked about being in the MVP race. It was always like James Harden was always like that fifth or sixth person. Right. And so I never in my mind, I mean, it makes sense. But in my mind, I never really viewed him as a top three candidate for the MVP. Mm -hmm. And then he was in there. I was like, okay, that's kind of weird. And then I felt like a lot of people, because the media loves Luca. Like, don't get me wrong. They love Luca. backlash effect, kind of. Yeah. So there was like, okay, we need to get Luca in something. So let's put him in most improved player, which um, I thought it was Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I thought it was weird when you would see, like, before they announced the final three, you would see them advertising, like, the MVP voting. And they'd have mm-hmm. five people on there, and they were putting Damian Lillard over them. And I'm like, mm-hmm. all right, I'm like, yeah, we know. Okay, now you look at what Dame did in the bubble, and I understand why a recency bias, even though Luca literally just did, like, 31, 11, and 11 um, during that I, same I, time. I understand, I understand that. I understand that, too, but they said, like, this, anything that happens in a bubble doesn't count for yeah exactly and so it's like yeah okay, i was so like, like well, how is damian lillard, how is damian lillard even there yeah like, he's on the playoffs exactly <laughs> at the time he wasn't in the playoffs and you're talking about luca being 28 9 and 9 nearly a 30 10 10 triple double average and mm-hmm. on a team that was the seven seed so mm-hmm. like yeah why does that not get the same attention i agree i think that uh luca is in the category he's in for improved player not yeah yeah you could look at his numbers and say well yeah of the guys in there he had the biggest leap forward in like points per game and stuff like that and you you can mm-hmm. look at Giannis like, in the year or two before he won MVP and see where he won most improved player mm-hmm. so it's not like there's not a precedent for it but it is kind of a weird conversation to say like wait a minute so he he was a top five in MVP but he also gets to be in most improved player which is usually like a role player award that's kind of yeah. weird he'll probably end up winning <laughs> it. Um, but I think it'll be one of those things where you're just like, oh, hey, great, thanks. Yeah. Like, just kind of like put it Almost. in the back of his closet and like, all right. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So uh, what's your, before we wrap this up here, what is your gut feeling for the series? I know we've kind of talked around it, but I feel like it bears some. Mavs and six. Out. There, there it is. I said it. Mavs and six. Mavs and six. All right. <laughs> <laughs> nah, uh, All right, let's I'll, do a Rondo I'll, jersey I'll bet on it. <laughs> 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 the correct answer never. is like, oh I, man, I would <laughs> never risk ever having to wear a Rondo jersey under any circumstances. <laughs> Nor can I see nah. how any self-respecting human being would ever do such a thing. <laughs> but uh, I, like not. Yeah. Um, I would say, I would say Clippers in six. Okay. If it's Clippers in six, uh, I think I've gotten everything I could have ever hoped for out of this Mavericks season, and I say that honestly. I mean, I know like mm-hmm. some people are going to say, like, oh, well, you know, before the injuries kind of started up, they were as high as the two seed in the West, and they're the only team that beat both L.A. Lakers and uh, mm-hmm. the Bucks this season, and they did both on the road. Only team that certainly did that, and like, one of those games is without Luca. Exactly. Like, so you look at these things and like I understand what people are saying, but I also think like the inexperience, the good okay to good roster around them. And I and I again I say that um liking a lot of the guys that we have, but also understanding that we're missing at least two very key roles that we just don't have quite the right parts mm. for. Um yep. So, yeah, between all that and what we set the bar for going into the season, that just being, hey, let's just get to the playoffs. Let's get a year of Luka and KP, knock the rust off of KP, and see if he's still that same dude. I think not only is he that same dude, I think he's better than that dude. I think he's the way he's playing post-January, he is better than the all-star addition that the Knicks got before his injury. So, yeah, I I think you've gotten everything you could hope for other than let's get him some hard-knock experience and let them – understand and learn exactly what they need to do to get over that hump. And the fact that they are going against a team that is a title favorite, I think only serves them better because not only are you getting a sense of, Hey, this is playoff experience and hard nosed basketball. No, you're going against probably one of the three best teams in the playoffs. If you can hang tight with them, even if you lose in five, let's say you hang tight in three or four Uh of those games and you steal a game then, okay, there you go. You know you're not terribly far off from being better than 80% of the playoff field. Mm-hmm. Honestly, honestly, if they played any other team, okay, let's let's take out the Lakers. If it was any other team 
in the playoffs, I would give him a fair shot of winning any other matchup. Yeah. Any other matchup. Like if it was Denver, I would like I can I could see I can see the Mavericks beating Denver. I can see the Mavericks beating the Rockets. I can definitely see the Mavericks beating the Jazz without uh Bogdanovich. Um, I can. Thunder I can would see be a Mavs. little tough. I think. Thunder will be a t- Thunder will be. Thunder tough. is a very balanced team, and so balanced yeah. they're going to beat the Rockets in the first round anyway. Suck it, East Side. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, suck it, East Side. But uh, yeah, I, I, I can, I can definitely see them win. But with our luck, we did happen to be matched up. I, my brother, yeah. my brother, he, he's like a. I don't want to say a casual fan, but he. He's a little in the basketball. He's more in the basketball than he used to be, but he's a big uh, Kawhi fan. Okay. Um, and so he's been making fun of me. He's like, I, I knew it was your luck. That was the one team you didn't want to see in the playoffs. And I was just like, if anything can happen, please. Like, can we can we do the? You remember before the bubble started? And we were like, we should do just like top 16 teams. Oh, yeah. We're all going to yeah. be the same play. And there was like, we still match up with the Clippers. I was like, God dang it. Yeah. <laughs> I was so bad. All right, we should have stopped. That. We should have probably. We probably still should have done that. Honestly, yeah. Just like top sixteen teams, we're all in the same spot. Like we don't need a freaking Western Conference and all that. Whatever. Right, right. Just make it like a bubble, bubble championship. Make it. I mean, make I, it at this point, I probably would have, but again, who knows how it would have <laughs> worked biased. out now? Like off the top of my head, I don't. We know probably much. still would have been matched up with the Clippers. And the- Going in, that's where we were. I guess it's probably where we would still yeah. be now with how it's shaped up. But if it's 16 yeah. teams, then you got to look at what the East did in their eight games. So I don't know if it would have slightly rearranged. But, yeah, I, I, I feel probably like this is going to be Clippers in five. Um, I would gladly be wrong and have it be six even just because mm-hmm. I think that – I think offensively, if they're, if they're shot makers or making shots, if Seth Curry looks like the guy shooting 45%, you know, before the bubble, before the season suspended, over his last, like, 21 games, he was shooting, like, 54% from three. Like, yeah. he was a flamethrower. And if you can have any kind of semblance of that guy, then, yeah, you're going to be in good position because that's a weapon that's not there consistently enough for you. You certainly didn't have it consistently enough in the bubble, plus he missed three games, uh, mm-hmm. either with the calf injury or resting the calf. So that's a big impact there. Tim Hardaway Jr. has been up and down in the bubble, yet he shot just a hair under 40% on the season. Like, you have all these examples over here that bear mentioning. If you got guys like that stepping up and playing at or above their level, and Luka and KP do, like, their their typical production or, God forbid, their bubble production, then you've got a chance to play with anybody, including the Clippers. My issue remains... How are they going to respond in the third quarter? Like oh, after yeah. halftime adjustments, how are mm-hmm. they going to respond in the clutch? And what are they going to do as far as can the role players consistently play at that level for a seven game series? Cause if you somehow up in them, it's going to take every inch of seven games. And I just I don't think they've got the guys to do that right now. I was encouraged. Um, I forgot which game it was. I think it was. I think it was the Milwaukee game, mm-hmm. where it did get close at the end, mm-hmm. and I, it looked like Luca consciously switched up his attack. Yeah. Uh, for the clutch, because I remember he was putting up more layups um, at the end, mm-hmm. and it was like, thank God, because what we tend to do is settle. Luca for- drives in. Yeah. Etc. Luca kicks it out to the corner, uh, especially uh, after the first Suns game where he literally had a one on one with Mikael Bridges. I'm not even sure if he might. It looked like at least trying to draw position. the foul. Yeah, but he Luca does this thing where he's so good at decelerating that he leaves the defender off where, and he has a little bit of hang time where he just stays in the air just long enough to just get a, a good precision shot at the end, but he didn't do it. Yeah. He was one-on-one with Mikhail Bridges to end the game, and he threw it out to KP, and he's like, what are you doing, dude? Right. Um, I mean, that was a pretty good look for a guy that had, you know, shot, I think, pretty well in that game. But, yeah, I get your point. You want the high percentage. For KP, that was the high yeah, percentage. Yeah, but it's, yeah, it's one, one-on-one. Like, I, I don't care how good anyone is shooting. Um, 
and I'm not sure if what I'm saying is is uh, sacrilegious in terms of analytical basketball. Right. But give me a contested two than a contested three any day of the week. Yeah. Like, I don't I don't care, especially at the end of the game, uh, because a you're not going to get the call. That call that happened against Damian Lillard. Well, is, Lillard got everything not, that game. He turned into Lillard got every, Lillard Wade. got everything that game, but the majority of the time. Whistles are not being blown at the end of the game. Yeah. So you're not gonna you're not gonna get all the way to the end. You're not gonna get all the way to the basket and get a clean look off. You're gonna get beaten around. Right. Um. So that that's one of the this goes back to my point where I say Luca should probably develop a mid range shot because I did have a somewhat of a hot take where, um, and I'm not sure if we're going over time, but my hot take was, hey, at the end of the games, if it's a one point game. I want KP taking the shot until I have Luca develop a mid range game. Yeah. Or something like that. Because he, or Luke, KP with the least of size can shoot over somebody. Right. Um, but if, if KP, if Luke is only going to rely on his step back three point shot or trying to make a layup to win the game, mm-hmm. he's going to, it's going to be a, either a dumb shot or uh, a super highly contested, maybe even fouled shot at the end where, you know, I can get, a 15 footer with KP shooting over somebody, he might not make it, but it will be a far better look than yeah, what a better look. Luca can current, yeah, what Luca can currently provide for us. So, but at the end of the game where he rose up and he hit the layup, I was so encouraged by that. And I, I like yeah. yelled like a little girl. It was, I was quite happy. For but sure. that's some of the things that we need to do, especially in this playoff. Hopefully, we we will do that when when we're in the clutch time. Is hey, we need a get buckets yeah just stop stop looking for the three-point shot and let's like all right bucket time it's winning time get buckets right and the last thing i would say as well threes. on it um before we wrap up here for the for the mavericks attack like that portland game w- kind of was like the biggest embodiment of it i think you saw kp go nuts for 16 in the first quarter and he's mm-hmm. shooting just the absolute lights out and then in the second quarter, you know, I don't have a problem with him coming out of the first quarter when he did. That's his usual rest time. But then in the second mm-hmm. quarter, he gets n- no points, almost no looks. I know the Blazers mm-hmm. changed up their defense to a zone, and that kind of threw things a little out of whack. I know Dallas didn't close the first quarter or even the second quarter the way they like to. But mm-hmm. it's like, okay, you got a guy that's red hot, and then you completely go away from him. And then in the third yeah. quarter, he was red hot again with 14 points. Gave him 30 going into the fourth quarter. And then in the fourth quarter, he doesn't get his first shot until there's four and a half minutes left. Like, yeah, that you, that we can't do that. You cannot. We you cannot. have to understand who the hot hand is, and you have to ride that into the dirt. You basically have to say like, you can't just say, "Oh, hey, this is working really well now." Okay, well, this opens up over this, and it opens up over this, and then suddenly you're off in like this little tangent parts of the offense. It opens up. And you're like trying to see if those are doing anything. Where it's like, no, 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 they haven't stopped the original thing yet. Keep going to that. Yeah. Like, yeah. make them stop you. And even in that first or that last Clippers game, KP showed how he could take over. He came out with six minutes left. He oh, came out bro, after running yes. off like nine points in like a minute and a half. And then yes. that killed the momentum. He went from 101 all to it getting out of the hand. And then by the time, yeah, you put Luca in as he came out. I understand what Rick was kind of trying to do there, but it just mm-hmm. shows KP is showing he's capable of taking over these games. He's not just, he's not, it's not one and two. It's not Batman and Robin at this point. It's basically yeah. Batman and Superman. It's one, one a and one B. And you mm-hmm. have to understand that. Like until they take him out, like make him start missing shots or like getting in his head frustrating him or anything like that until he's at least missed a couple in a row we cannot go away from him when he's in the process of taking over so yep find Even what works Luke is in the game write it into the ground at least for that moment and then you know come back to it when you need to but i think you need to keep him more engaged that's that's the only other thing i would say if you're going to do something you have to rely on your stars to be absolute yep. stars for you and it's not enough yep. in that case to say, hey, he had a big first and a third and he closed well for us. Great. What do you do in the second? What do you do in the first half of the fourth quarter? So, yep. yeah. I'm so. I'm in 100%. I'm in 100% agreement with you, brother. Well, there yeah, you go. That, yeah, so. But, yeah, so I think that'll wrap up uh, for this one. I know this has been a longer 
preview for game one Monday night. Uh, that always happens do? with us. I'm sorry. That's oh, fine. We haven't we haven't <laughs> talked in a while, so no, always fun to run it back. But uh, yeah, we'll do we'll try to plan to do a pregame show the day before every game in this series, and mm-hmm. uh, we'll usually probably probably shoot for about 45 minutes, maybe an hour. This one it looks like we ran about an hour 20, whatever. Gosh but, darn it. <laughs> We always have that problem. We always say like 45 minutes and then we double that time up pretty much. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, I think that'll do it. If you guys haven't already, like the video, drop a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. Until next time, remember, any, take it away. Oh gosh, you really got to give me this responsibility? Yeah, Every that, that are your legend. five the previews. <laughs> oh gosh, oh, no, even, even more pressure. Every legend was once a prospect. There you go. Salute. I did it. I did it.